I love kids. I can't tell you how much I love kids. I remember even growing up, you know, as a teenager at family parties, I would be the one with a beach ball stuck underneath my shirt, running around chasing the little kids. I think it's because basically I'm a big kid trapped in a Superbono's body. But nonetheless, I became a father about six years ago, and I love it. I'm eating it up. Every moment has been great. I mean, I've been here in Madrid for two days only, and I miss my Timmy and my Anna. But there's just something about looking in the eye of a child and seeing that hope in their eyes and seeing the opportunity they face and the dreams that they can live out. That's something for me, it just, I just want to fly when I see that. Over the last 10 years, I've also had the honor of visiting kids in the poorest regions of the world. And when I think about their reality, what they're going to face, the opportunities they will never have, the hope that will never happen, it just, it just haunts me. I can't shake it. If you think about who, the, who are the poorest of the poor in the world, it's actually kids. So it's really my passion for kids that has led me to consider poverty. But it turns out that poverty is the center and the root issue of so many problems of our global society today. Disease, slavery, terrorism, violence, corruption, access to clean water, the list goes on and on. The more poor you are, the more these other things happen. The more these other things happen, the more poor you are and the more poor you stay and the more poor your children stay. So a nice man comes to your slum and you're a dad of four kids and he says, there's a factory opening up in the next state. We gotta go today, the slots are filling up. Why don't you send your two daughters with me? I'll pay you some money now, we'll pay you some money after the season. And you're a dad in the slum and your kids haven't eaten in three weeks. What choice do you have? So those daughters, those, your two girls, they go to that factory and it turns out that factory, they manufacture terrorists there actually. And so that is the haunting thing about poverty is that they have no options. So I started digging into poverty and one thing that just really, oh, it just took the air out of me is that there's 500 million kids living in poverty today. Think about that number. That's more than the population of the United States. 750,000 sex slaves. These are children being exploited, forced, drugged, abused, so that they can serve as 30 or 40 clients, if you can call them that. Seven days a week, 365 days a year. As my friend Tim says, they don't have dreams. They've already died. And in four seconds, a child has died because of poverty. In my TED talk today, 270 kids will die. Water is a huge issue. One in seven people on the earth do not have access to clean water. In Africa alone, 40 billion hours is spent getting water. This is women and children having big jugs of water on their back, walking for miles, facing the elements, fending off predators, both animal and human, to a well that probably has water that's already contaminated. I mean, if you're spending that much time with water, I mean, Education and work, forget about it. I mean, 40, mil, 40 billion hours, that's like taking every young person in Spain, age 20 and, and under, and basically they would work full time all year round, just collecting water. And then this last one just really rocked me. There are more slaves today than there have ever been in human history. 
27 million people are being exploited right now for $32 billion of profits. Organized crime goes like this, drugs, arms, humans. You could literally, there are streets in this world today where you could go down that street and you could find a little girl in a cage, probably the age of my daughter, who's three, and you could buy her for $50. $50 for a human life. That's more disposable than your cell phone. I mean, if it doesn't work well, you just gouge out an eye, cut off an arm, get a new one. So how do you feel right now? What are some of the thoughts that are going through your mind? What do you feel in your gut right now? How does it feel? And I'll tell you what I felt. I mean, I felt a lot of things. I was, I would, I was just overwhelmed and speechless, first of all. I was just... I, I was very sad. Poverty is a terrible thing, but the, the people that suffer the most are kids. I was angry, thinking about those people that treat their fellow human beings so cruel and brutally. I wanted to go beat them up, you know? I felt ashamed. You know, I haven't done anything about this. I felt a little denial, like, this can't be happening. Maybe these statistics are made up to get funding or, you know, and, and then finally I just felt despair. Like, I'm just the guy lives in suburban Chicago with my wife and two kids and three fish and in a little town home and living our life. What can I do? So one day, I made a s small decision. It, was, it took a little bit of courage. I had to muster some courage up and a, a little bit of struggle and really compelled by my own faith in a God that I believe loves these children. I decided that this ugly, gross reality of poverty, I would make that part of my reality. I would think about it every day. I would talk to people about it. It's not the best dinner time discussion <laughs> topic. But I would make it a part of me. This yucky, gross, ugly reality of the world, I would let it, I would embrace it, I would accept it as a little part of me. And then something happened to me after that. The new thing that I felt was, I felt energized. I felt motivated. I mean, I. I I wanted to like, come on, let's do it. Let's do it. So this is where I took my humanitarian hat off and I put on my business entrepreneur hat. And I said, what do business people do well? Like, what would a business look like if it were to address this kind of poverty? What business people do well, three things. Identify an unmet market need. Leverage market forces and trends. Innovate to meet that need. So we thought, what do the poor need? The poor, they need water, they need food, clothing, shelter, yes. But if you give someone a loaf of bread, that loaf of bread is gone tomorrow. You give them another loaf of bread that day, they actually start, you create a dependency on you. Meanwhile, the bread maker down the street who's trying to earn an honest living, you just put him out of business. Same thing with shirts. 
you know, we dump our unwanted shirts to, you know, with good intentions, to like after the Haiti earthquake or whatever, most of it gets funneled off into corrupt channels. The shirt maker in Haiti, his market is gone. The poor don't need a handout. They need a hand up. And if you're talking about, you know, put back your business person on, hard metrics results poverty reduction. Some of the things we do, they feel good, but they're not real good when it comes to charity and aid. So real good, what does real good look like? What the poor need is a job. With a job comes sustainable income. With sustainable income, you can provide for your family. You start to have options. You start to think about how to change the circumstance with you and your family and your neighborhood and your slum. You start to lead. You are empowered to work yourself out of poverty yourself. The dignity of work. So with those things in mind, three things, three market forces that we started to think about. Microinvestment, fair trade, and cost purchasing. Microinvestment, you know, this is like a $100 loan. You give someone to buy, you know, some seeds, a solar kit, a cow, a sewing machine, and then they work. They're empowered to work themselves out of poverty. They employ people in their community. They pay back the loan in amazingly high rates. But we thought, wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't it be cool if, you could, if we could actually buy the products being made by the person you just gave a loan to? That would be really cool, creating this one-to-one -one relationship between the consumer and the crafter. Fair trade. Fair trade item basically is you buy a fair trade item, you, you have some assurance that the people who made it were treated fairly, were paid a fair wage. Five billion dollar industry, huge with coffee and chocolate. But if you look around this room, if you look at all the bags that we have, this shirt, all the stuff that we're wearing, I mean, I don't know honestly if this shirt was made by slaves or not. And the problem with fair trade is that they're designed with the country of origin in mind, and then they're pushed onto the Western market. And so it's not really that mainstream. So you might buy it once, it's a good cause, it's for a gift, not sustainable, sorry. So we thought, what if you could create apparel, stuff that we love to buy, and make it cool and, hip and mainstream? Cost purchasing, you know, tying, Tom's is probably the best example. Tying a cool product with a good cause. You know, for every pair of shoes you buy, Tom's will give a new pair of shoes to a child in need. Brilliant. Awareness, marketing. But wouldn't it be cool if the, those hit products were actually being made by the people that we're trying to save, we're trying to empower? A hand up, not a hand out. So we believe that the collision of these three market forces over the next 10 years represents potentially one of the largest consumer behavior shifts in the, for a long time. More and more studies show cause and impact are not a factor, but the factor for young people in terms of what they want, where they want to work, what they, where they want to invest, and what they want to buy. We call it movement one-to-one -one because it's not good enough just to have a good product or that it does no evil or that it is linked to a cause. You have to have a good product that actually does sustainable life change. You're doing good and you actually know who you're doing good to, who you're empowering, that one-to-one -one relationship. So that's the new kind of product that we call cause gear. And so we are trying to empower individuals and corporations, because you know what? Corporations buy all this stuff all the time for clients and stakeholders and whatnot, to activate a movement of these people, to transform the lives of one million people trapped in unfathomable poverty and injustice, to become self-sustaining. And how it would work is this. You know, we started with backpacks, for example. You buy a backpack, you open it up, 
Right on the tag, you see Made in India by Amrita. And you see Amrita's picture right on the tag. And then you go online and you read Amrita's amazing story, how she's basically felt like a piece of meat her whole life. How her mom used to use her as a prop with an empty milk bottle getting to get you know, better return on her begging. And how her husband once tried to sell her to a brothel. And how she escaped these negative forces to come to work for an organization that we partner with. And now she's making cause gear. And you see her life change and evolve as she gets more and more involved. Now, helping people is messy. So it doesn't always end in a fairy tale ending. But we believe you need that transparency. You need that authenticity. People need to know what it's really like. And you also need the transparency around the financial model. So 10% of the purchase would go directly to Amrita for making the bag. And 90% of the profits would also then go to directly empowering Amrita and people in her community with microfinance and skills training and other things like that. We believe this is a model for sustainable life change. There are people and organizations today already buying cause gear because they are basically making an investment in sustainable life change. Think about the impact of what this might do. If someone, if more and more people basically said, you know what, it's not enough anymore that I'm, this shirt is slave free. I want this shirt to set slaves free. And I want to know who, it, who they are. Let me end with one story about poverty um, and this one-to-one -one movement. I was in India last fall in the slums, and I was hanging out. Um, and I was doing my usual thing, playing with the kids. And these two girls, at first they were kind of like, who is this guy? I don't know about him. He's kind of weird. But then I started giving them high fives. And apparently high fives work in every culture there is. It's just like a universal language. So high fives, and they finally started to smile that day. So it was a, a sort of a special moment. And so I left that slum, and I felt this very odd thing. I actually felt envious of those two girls. And I was like, that's weird. I feel envious. And what, it, what I realized was their whole life is basically depend on God, be interdependent on people, and live in community and friendships together. And I thought, that's exactly what I want in my life. So what those two girls taught me, actually, is that I'm poor, too. And that poverty comes in different shapes and sizes. And that if we're brave enough, if I'm brave enough, this movement one-to-one, -one, it saves them, but it saves me too. I believe that the poorest of the poor, we, the fortunate few, and the marginalized many, we actually need each other to experience the greatest significance in life. Thank you.